Our speakers will set aside time at the end of their presentations to answer questions from the audience. You can type your question in the chat box any time during the presentation, and our speakers will answer them at the end. If you're attending the meeting for ISA CEU credit, raise your hand. To raise your hand, find the set status icon at the top of the screen and click on the drop down menu. Click raise hand. This webinar is being recorded. You can find it later on our website, forestry.usu.edu slash video slash webinars or on our Facebook page. Before we get started, um, I'd like to encourage you one more time to participate in our polls. And I'm going to close the polls in just a minute. So now is your last chance. All right, I'm going to close those down. Thank you so much for participating in those. All right, and we're going to get started here. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. Our first speaker is Chris McGinty, who is the Associate Director of the Remote Sensing and GIS Laboratory at Utah State University in Logan. He has more than 12 years of experience conducting geospatial project research, data collection, and project management. Chris's research areas of interest include landscape disturbance mapping, invasive vegetation species modeling, landscape and land cover modeling, monitoring, excuse me, remote sensing and classification of watersheds and object-based image analysis and feature extraction. All right, well thanks Rose and also thanks to Meredith for setting this up. <clears throat> this is a somewhat new experience for me being um, sequestered in my office getting to do a presentation while there's nobody staring at me. You all just have to listen. But uh, like Rose said, we'll have some questions uh, at the end um, for anybody here. So keep those and type them in the chat and we'll try and get to them. So as Rose said, I work for the remote sensing GIS lab here at USU. And a number of years ago, uh, Meredith uh, came to our lab uh, actually when John Lowry was working here started mapping the tree cover uh, tree canopy cover for Salt Lake County which uh, led into uh, us a, a couple years later continuing that project and, and continuing our mapping for the Wasatch Front and then a couple of select southern Utah regions so uh, this has been a, a great project we've been working on it for a while and it's it's been fantastic so just kind of getting into it, the whole objective for our side of it, and we'll lead into where this is all going when we visit with Ian and, and Meredith a little later on, but our real objective uh, at the Remote Sensing GIS Lab was to identify and map urban tree canopy cover so that we could produce a freely avail available digital GIS layer. So that would be a layer that would be available uh, for download from, from USU or from the AGRC or, or anybody else who wanted to host that layer. But really, we had to kind of you know, wrap our heads around, at least at the lab here, why we really wanted to map urban tree canopy cover. And I thought I'd start out by kind of covering these things here first off uh, to give you guys an idea where we were coming from. So why map urban tree canopy cover? Well, contrary to popular belief, at least in Utah, we're not completely dominated by small two-foot trees. Though we have a lot of tourists coming through and say that's about all they see is sagebrush out there. They're, they're not really trees. Um, but we do have a pretty substantial uh, forest component in Utah. Specifically, uh, we find trees in our riparian areas, uh, near streams, uh, cottonwoods, uh, willows, that sort of thing. Uh, in higher elevations, uh, we have a lot of conifers uh, until you get up to that snow line. Uh, we have a, a good deal of forests uh, along the Wasatch Spine and over into the Uintas, even out on the Grouse Creek. Um, and Deep Creek Ranges. And then of course we have uh, these tree canopy, uh, urban tree canopies uh, in all of our urban areas. And this is what we're really focusing on in, uh, in this, this analysis. 
So Utah's urban areas support a large number or large urban forests that are very important resources to our communities. And these have really largely been driven through settlement patterns. Uh, when the pioneers came into the, the valleys, you'll see some of the accounts saying that there was really no trees in the valleys at all. And so you can see there in the background, Cache Valley, you can tell where the, the settlements are. Uh, looking at Logan, uh, Hiram up there in the upper left-hand corner, uh, Wellsville, and uh, some of the other towns down there at the bottom of the, the picture. You can see where those communities are because really they are lined with trees. And so these urban tree canopy components are quite important. So why map the urban tree canopy? Well, it really leads to the understanding that urban trees um, really have some, some pretty major uh, ecosystem services that they provide. Uh, those include improving water quality, mitigating storm runoff, uh, reducing air pollution, increasing uh, energy conservation, and also providing food. And there's some average annual, be annual benefits uh, for public trees that, uh, that we, can, we can actually see monetarily which is available in the USDA Tree Guide, which anyone can download. Uh, fantastic resource if you haven't seen it. But really, some of the average annual benefits, um, starting with a small tree, can be from 9 to $14, um, anywhere up to $78 for a large tree. Now, remember, this is depending on how they're placed, the type of tree. Um, it's not just a tree that's, that might be growing out in a field somewhere, but something uh, in a more of an urban setting. Um, and then conifers, of course, have a slightly uh, lower annual benefit, but still a benefit. The caveat to that is that these uh, resources have to be maintained. And so there's some annual average costs for a public tree, um, but also for trees that are in your own yards. Um, and some of these trees uh, can cost up to you know, $17 per year to maintain. And that includes watering and trimming and, and keeping the trees generally healthy. And these numbers are, are specifically for the interior west. So there's, if you're joining from outside of the interior west, the uh, USDA has these books uh, for the entire, uh, at least the lower 48. They may have some information for Alaska and outlying areas as well. But it's a good thing to have these resources mapped so that we can really start putting some kind of a value to them and kind of keep track of, of the health and overall uh, uh, status of the, the urban trees because our urban forests are always tra changing. So the picture on your screen is uh, uh, after our large windstorms that we had along the Wasatch Front last, well really last spring, it was uh, the early spring I believe of 2012, uh, but that's a tree that was up on Harrison Boulevard. Uh, that, that big old tree snapped off and smashed right down onto the car. Um, indicating that our urban forests are always changing. And so having some sort of a resource map is, uh, is a really uh, handy, handy way to keep a, a handle on what's going on in, around the, the communities. So pretty substantial changes in our forests. So since these trees are important elements of our communities, we go ahead and inventory um, and maintenance costs. It makes sense to locate them. Uh, every tree has some value, some have more, some have less, have less, but it's really important to identify how much canopy we have, what the distribution of that canopy is, and how it changes through time. So with respect to this project, we uh, started out by identifying our areas that we were going to map. Uh, Salt Lake County was previously done by Dr. Lowry uh, when he was working on his PhD. Um, however, we, uh, we selected our areas being from Brigh Brigham City, Utah to Santa Quinn, the greater Cedar City area, and then the uh, greater St. George area. Oop. Let's get through those briefly. All right. So what was the, the data and the methods that we used to, to map out the urban tree canopy cover in these areas? Now, I'm going to spend less time on this, um, but if you guys have further questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them via email or, or other. Uh, later on, but we'll we'll cover some of the basics. The data that we used here was as simple as it could get. We used the 2009 USDA uh, NAEP National Agricultural Imagery Program data, which is a one meter spatial resolution four band, meaning that we we can see red, green, and blue, and near infrared uh, in the in the um, electromagnetic spectrum. Aerial photography. 
which is freely available. So this data, we intended on, on keeping our costs low. We wanted to make sure that we were just using data that was available. Uh, we didn't incorporate things such as LIDAR or m other multispectral imagery. We, we, kept it, we kept it quite simple. So this is just an example of what your imagery looked like. This is from along the Wasatch Front. The lower right portion of the image is uh, just a green band, or, or RGB, red, green, and blue, uh, true color band. Uh, in the left-hand corner there, you can see what that same imagery looks like using the near-infrared. So adding that near-infrared information, that channel into our analysis, gives us a little bit more information uh, with which to extract the, the tree canopy cover and, and try and separate that out from grass, shrubs, um, other things that may, may resemble tree canopy cover. So NAEP was ideal for mapping this tree canopy cover. Uh, one, because it was freely available. Uh, two, it was uh, reliably collected and is reliably and repeatedly collected. Uh, in Utah, we have it for 2006, 9, 11. Um, for this year, we have some HRO, high resolution ortho data for the Wasatch Front that was collected. Um, but it's on a repeating schedule uh, with the agreements between the state, the BLM, the Forest Service, and so on. So we can get that data, we can make sure it's collected, and it's, it's, all, it's, it's easily uh, uh, downloaded and used. It had a sufficient spatial resolution, which means the, the one meter pixel size. Uh, the one meter pixel size indicates that, it, that one meter on the ground is represented by one pixel. And then it has sufficient spectral resolution with that red, green, blue, and, and near infrared. So the methods were very, uh, pretty, pretty straightforward in the sense that we used a feature analyst for Esri's ArcGIS 10. Uh, the software, and this is where I'm, I'm leaving out many details, but really the software here that was used uh, was used to prepare the imagery. Uh, we de determined our classification approach, uh, created training data for target features, which were tree canopy. Uh, then we set up what we call learning parameters, and we ran this model on all of this imagery. Now our learning parameters kind of focus on color, reflectance, texture, and shape. Um, it would have been nice to include other types of data, but in this case we, we focused on using a, the, the least number we could so that we could really get uh, uh, we could repeat this easily uh, in the future at low cost. All right, so some of the results and accuracy that we came up with. Uh, here are the results. This is really the extracted urban tree canopy cover for Box Elder, Weber, and Davis counties. And you can see there in yellow on top of that topo, uh, that uh, terrain map provided by the AGRC, the extracted tree canopy cover. And if we zoom in here, you can start to see that it looks pretty good. We really did have a good opportunity uh, to capture the tree canopy cover. And if we zoom in even further, you can see that we don't have a lot of errors of omission, but, but certainly some commission in there. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. But really, uh, this uh, turned out quite well. We're very pleased with the simplicity of the model, the availability of the data. Uh, the results uh, were very, very pleasing. So there's a little bit of transparency there. You can see where we're, we're actually getting a little bit of extra in the inner spaces due to shadowing and some other effects. But, but overall, we were really able to, to uh, 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 extract the tree canopy cover uh, quite well. All right, uh, same data for the uh, Utah County area. So point of the mountain down to Santa Quinn, uh, the greater Cedar City area, and then the greater St. George area, uh, Hurrican, Laverkin, Tokerville, uh, Leeds, uh, Santa Clara were all, all included in that, in that area of analysis. So let's talk accuracy for just a second. Um, so if you if you look at the accuracy values here, uh, you know some of you who are GIS scientists and geospatial specialists will say, well, that seems awfully good, and and it was awfully good, in a sense that we were looking at overall accuracy. We uh, took a series of random randomly selected points, and we were that uh, were associated with trees, and we were uh, comparing them to what we were capturing, and so we were coming out with a a good uh, area or overall accuracy. Uh, however, we did run into some errors of, of commission where we had pixels that were committed to 
a tree class where they most likely shouldn't have been, uh, but it was it was uh, certainly very good for the models and the data that were used. So uh, 88, 85, uh, Utah County came out very well. Uh, we spent a little more time working on Utah County uh, than Cedar City and St. George. So just uh, a quick little metric here, and, and Ian will lead into talking about a lot more of this type of stuff. Uh, but uh, looking at our existing existing urban tree canopy cover per municipality, and this in, this uh, graph here is done for the, our our friends down in in the southern part of the state. Um, what you can see here is the existing percent urban tree canopy cover uh, per municipal area, and uh, Fairly good. Cedar City has a pretty high percent. Eight percent of their municipal air by area is uh, urban tree canopy. Um, uh, Washington, not so much. Uh, Cedar City, around two percent. But what you have to do is take this with a bit of a grain of salt. So if we l get in here a little closer to St. George at two percent, what you'll notice here is that St. George really has annexed in a huge amount of land. So close to 48,000 acres within the, the St. George municipal boundary, um, at least as of earlier this spring. And so down there to the, the line, out to the new airport, and then you know all the way up, up to the north there. So that's, the, that's the, the St. George municipal boundary. And what you can see there is there's a lot of area out there that has no trees and doesn't really have any chance of, of being considered urban by any means. And so your, your overall uh, percent of urban tree canopy is is appearing quite low when in actuality St. George and those guys working in St. George have a fantastic uh, uh, set of, of well uh, urban forests down there and it, it looks very good um, but by by municipality boundary it uh, looks quite small so some of these numbers you need to take with a bit of grain of salt and and really delve into the data a bit more All right, so uh, just getting through this, how is it going to benefit you and, and what's next? Well, specifically, this data will be freely available and is, is available. Um, and we can uh, certainly put this website up. Uh, if it isn't live, we've had some, some server issues this weekend. It will be shortly. Uh, but this data will be available. Uh, we'll send it down to the AGRC so they can host it if they wish. Uh, but all of the data that we've put together that uh, Meredith and her organization has paid for uh, will be freely the freely available, um, and we'll also be you know sharing it and and using it in in future projects. So some of the future work that we see um, partnering with UTC uh, urban tree canopy experts uh, such as Ian um, to develop some practical applications and really put this data to use so it's not just something that's done and done and we actually can get it out there and start really doing something with it, making it useful to, to the folks that are that are very uh, uh, interested in the data. Uh, development of uh, research-based UTC analysis, such as the work that's been done by Virginia Tech. And eventually, what we'd like to see is some statewide, or at least I'd like to see statewide urban tree canopy mapping and then a, re you know, a schedule where this is repeated uh, and ongoing. Right now, uh, Cache Valley really doesn't have much work that's been done. Uh, and, and of course, places like Vernal and Beaver and, and other, or other cities or smaller municipalities don't have this, this completed, at least not on the scale that we've, that we've worked at. And so we'd like to, we'd like to see that progress in the, in the future. So um, if there's any questions, I'll, I'll page, page through the chat and see if I can see any, and I'll work on answering those. Um, but certainly, please contact me if you have questions on our methods. In the future, we would really like to work on using LIDAR um, and including some other data layers that will really enhance our ability to measure the urban tree canopy and, and really delineate it um, to, a, to a whole other degree. Uh, but certainly with uh, the funding available, this has turned out to be a fantastic project. So I believe that's it for me. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Rose. Thanks, Chris. Um, be patient with us while we switch around the presentations. And we'll have Ian come up next. Rose, do you want to answer a few of these questions that are that are coming through the chat for Chris? 
Sure. Um, Chris, if you'll if you'll come back on with your microphone, um, I'll ask a question. This is from Joe Sexton. He says, "How is the extent of the data determined relative to the municipal boundaries?" Can you answer that? Um, yes, I can, I think. I was just reading Joe's follow-up. Well, the the extent of the data, I guess I'm not, I'm not following it uh, just perfectly. Maybe Joe and I can talk offline, but the, oh, he's typing again. Let him follow up a second. All right, and we're just about ready for Ian's presentation to start. Um, well, why don't you guys go ahead and start, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, work on getting my answers put together, and we can finish this up at the end of the end of the hour. Great. Rose, can you hear me? So I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself. Great. Go ahead, Ian. All right, and you can hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, and thanks, Meredith, as well as Rose and Chris, for the opportunity to join you today. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Ian Hanau, and I'm uh, owner and principal at Planet Geo, uh, just outside of the Denver uh, area. Um, I've done a little bit of work with Urban Tree Canopy in Utah, specifically in um, Salt Lake City with Bill Rutherford uh, probably five or six years ago. We, we conducted kind of an initial Urban Tree Canopy assessment, but really um, primarily more focused on sort of some research uh, looking at multispectral imagery. Um, so uh, that's the extent of my experience recently, at least uh, in Utah, but um, wanted to give us uh, some examples of how we've used the data that Chris just introduced um, for different projects across the country. Uh, the types of ways we can analyze the data, the types of tools we can make, and so forth. Um, so I believe, uh, let me just, I want to go to the next slide, Rose, do I, hold on here, page down. Rose, you might need to show me where I... Oh, hold on, I think I found it. There we go. I got it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I want to go over today is sort of how we talk urban tree canopy assessment terminology, what the processes are, uh, the, the methods that we use, uh, a little bit more on the data to expand on what Chris started, um, how we use the land cover classification data, to do the urban tree canopy assessment process. Um, and this is something that really there's a, there's a lot of options, probably more than most people realize when it comes to looking at tree cover and in ways we can use the information uh, to direct policy, to direct management, uh, to develop partnerships for where we want to go, to assess ur urban ecosystem uh, benefits that trees provide that, that Chris introduced. Um, we also have some uh, tools as well as some methods and uh, techniques for looking at tree cover goal setting. Uh, that's definitely something we're, we're seeing more and more of across the country. Um, and then we also have some interactive tools, um, some real low technology, uh, low tech tools, as well as uh, some higher end, more sophisticated technologies uh, involving uh, GIS and tree benefits, uh, forecasting um, what, what our cities look like now versus what they could look like. Um, and really how to put that in a planning context. So that's overall, that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, there are some additional resources at the end of this presentation that uh, I don't think we'll, we'll get into today, but we, I just want to let you know that there, there are some about really where we see canopy cover um, in, in the world of planning right now uh, and in the news. Uh, so to go ahead and just jump into this, um, so speaking urban tree canopy assessment. This is something I've been doing for about seven years now. Uh, probably 80 or 90 percent of my time has been devoted on, on urban forestry and canopy cover assessment. And in making the information more usable, um, more, um, I guess, widely uh, applicable uh, for all different types of users. Um, so, but it's not always in the forefront of others' minds. And so that's what I want to start with and helping you to kind of visualize what some of 
the products and outcomes from an urban tree canopy assessment uh, look like and, and how you can have direct control over what that, what that might be if you were going to uh, move forward with this data and do more with it. Um, so a few things that Chris has already introduced, the imagery that was used uh, in Utah, and we've done similar mapping work and used this uh, same type of imagery uh, all across the country. Um, uh, just I'll focus on the last two really in particular. Um, beyond just mapping the tree canopy cover, I'll show you some examples of mapping other land cover class classifications uh, in urban areas. One of these is really to look at where the areas where it's um, biophysically possible, where it's most reasonable to plant trees in cities. Um, and I have some visuals coming up next that I'll talk about how we create this from the land cover data and how we turn it into meaningful numbers uh, and assessment reports and so forth. Um, another category is the areas that I'm sorry, everybody. It looks like um, Ian has left the presentation. We might have him come back in just a minute. I hope I'm not the only one who's not hearing him. Um, so in the meantime, maybe we can uh, ask some questions sure. or have, have you know, I can follow up with Joe's question real quick once I uh, Great, figured out thanks, what he Chris. was what he was saying and it was it was actually quite clear I just wasn't uh, focusing on um, Joe asked you know what about why weren't the you know, the the municipal boundaries and the uh, urban tree canopy cover data that I showed for St George municipal boundary wasn't coincident um, and how was the percent cover calculated I actually. Uh, didn't show, but I had clipped out. We had subset out the, the urban tree canopy cover for the municipal boundary calculated area based on those two uh, different feature classes. Um, but I did show you kind of the greater um, St. George area with all that data, rather than when the, with the data clipped out just to the St. George municipal boundary. So it was actually a good catch. That's something that I should note for future presentations and, and really clip that data down. Um, Joe also asked if uh, this data was available for 2006. Uh, no, we haven't uh, done any work uh, going back in time just yet. Um, I don't know if that's something that will ever be funded, but certainly uh, it would be interesting to start mapping this change through time. Um, the change detection is, is something that I'm very interested in, but we definitely will need to find funding to do that. Um, Phyllis asked if there's plans for mapping the Cache Valley area. I, I again, if we can get something uh, funded, then we certainly will. Uh, we've, I've, I've run the the numbers on how much it would cost, and and it, you know, if there's agencies out there, we're certainly willing to do it. Um, and it would be very beneficial for the folks here in Cache Valley. But I'd also like to see it done, really throughout the. Uh, other parts of the state. Um, I think we need to look over it with the changes going on in Vernal and in some of these other areas and in the southern part of the state would be uh, beneficial to do that too. And it looks like Ian has rejoined us, so can you, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, lost internet connection for about one minute, so um, it just took a second to get it back up. So. Um, it sounded like you were answering some questions that came up, Chris. Um, and I can probably just jump back into things. Yep, go right ahead. OK. Uh, apology, hopefully that won't happen again. Um, that's what we get with technology, right? Um, <laughs> so um, getting back into some of the visuals related to the different types of urban tree canopy um, assessment metrics that we produce uh, beyond just simply the, the existing tree cover, um, we, we break out the land cover data into these possible planting areas that we subcategorize as impervious. And primarily, this is going to be things like parking lots, where biophysically, yes, you could, you could either make new room or use existing room in and around parking lots uh, where you could plant trees uh, and then enjoy the many benefits that trees, trees and tree shade provides uh, in these highly impervious areas. Um, the PPA or planting area, possible planting area vegetation category uh, is primarily your, your turf grass and open space. Um, 
and again, there's especially in areas like uh, like Denver as well as um, uh, the in Utah where it's important where irrigation is really where you're only going to have um, uh, at least currently irrigated areas is where you're going to be able to establish tree canopy. Um, we can break out this out so that, as an example, as Chris mentioned, the um, sagebrush, for example, uh, would not you would not want to categorize that as possible planting area necessarily. Um, and then another uh, a type of, of metric we, we can assess is, is canopy change, uh, and I have a couple examples of that later on. Um, so I mentioned the unsuitable category uh, in this, and one of the things we've done, it, it takes a little more time, definitely a little more cost, is to actually go through and look for areas where, for example, these recreation fields you see, where we're not going to establish tree cover. So the, the metrics, the results of the assessment, if you looked at this individual parcel, let's say, and you clicked on this in the GIS database at the end of a UTC assessment, rather than this saying that it's 90% plantable, it's probably going to say 5 or 10% plantable. Um, so that's the type of uh, uh, impact that this, uh, this process has in the data. Uh, let, me, let me again take what Chris was doing and sort of expand on that here uh, with these other classifications and, the ter and sticking here with the terms. Uh, one way to visualize this is I made just a, a, a random 5x5 uh, five five grid cell and we overlaid that on essentially when we're doing our mapping this would represent the areas of tree cover in our cities this would represent the parking lots and these uh, six grid cells down here we have uh, turf grass over top so if in our in our very simple example uh, if there was nothing else sort of in the background or behind these trees really we'd look at this grid cell and we would say that well approximately forty percent of that is covered by tree cover uh, if we look in these four grid cells, you know they have 85 to 95 percent um, parking lot area. So we can use the models in this process to um, assess what we have. Now, of course, in reality, you have these trees over top of some of the grass and over top of some of the impervious areas, and we have those combinations that we can use in the way that we build these data sets uh, and how we can query those or make specific maps. And I have some examples coming up where I'll show you how we take the data and sort of go to that next step. Um, just again to help visualize this, uh, here's something from a past report that we had used. Uh, we're showing the uh, possible planting areas, the vegetated planting areas, and our existing tree cover. So we can break that out citywide, of course, but we can also break that out at much finer scales, and I have some examples of how we've done that as well. Um, just one distinction, um, a term that's been around for, for quite some time, sort of from the beginning of urban tree canopy assessment, uh, the U.S. Forest Service and Northern Research Station were using the term um, possible urban tree canopy or possible UTC. Um, we have steered away from using that term mostly because really what you're actually mapping, and this is a very clear example, is that this is your possible planting area, but it doesn't, doesn't represent the canopy. Um, so there's two distinct things. And so it's very clear that it, it needs to be clear that at the parcel level, uh, or if we're at a watershed level, or maybe a neighborhood, or citywide, when you add up all of these areas, that's really your total plantable area, but it doesn't necessarily represent your canopy. Um, so again, this is sticking with uh, sort of the overall of, of trying to understand the terms involved and, and hoping, I'm hoping that you're, you're can able to better visualize uh, these products now. So let's dive into part of the process. Um, I'll talk about the components involved in UTC assessment, how I would recommend you, you think about designing your own canopy assessment, what would be the most useful in, in your community. Um, we'll talk about some of the common deliverables that you receive from these assessments, uh, and, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we do the reporting um, and some of the recommendations typically that come out of these assessments. So at a very high level here, we, we have four components. We have data coming in to the assessment, we have data coming out of the assessment, uh, we have the assessment itself, and then we have how we present and how we report the information. So we tend to collect as much localized data uh, from a city. They may have already made an investment in mapping their building footprints, their streets, their parking lots. Uh, we can incorporate all that data. Um, up here we have wetlands and water areas. Uh, ultimately, we put all of that together into a single mosaic, if you will, of the land cover uh, at the time that the imagery was collected. Uh, so here's an example with eight different classifications. We can use these classifications 
to create the PPA vegetation, PPA impervious, uh, and then we can use that at different scales. So here's an example uh, of neighborhood scale in Washington, D.C. that we used. Uh, there's 37 neighborhoods. So now you have this information broken out, um, not just citywide again, but, but down to a, a scale where you can start to actually do some more planning and some implementation. Um, and then finally the reporting, and I'll show some uh, components of that as we go. So in thinking about assessing canopy cover as well as plantable space, uh, you know, potential planting areas in your community, I, I would think of it in the sense that there are assessment boundaries that can help you politically to better understand where you're at and to message the results. Uh, so maybe it's um, city council or an alderman or um, you know, different, different wards and so forth. So there's sort of political boundaries that you can assess existing and, and possible tree canopy. Um, there are more environmental data layers. You could have corridors for riparian streams. Uh, you might have watershed or sub, you know, sub drainages, and you want to know how our canopy is broken out in, in those types of more environmental um, perspectives. And then at, at more of a social and community level, uh, we have neighborhoods where a lot of action actually takes place on the ground, and we have census data. So the census data, 2010, for example, that recently uh, came out, that includes, of course, a wealth of demographic information, but census blocks, census groups, uh, uh, census block groups, and then census tracts are three different scales uh, that are available to look at um, how does canopy cover differ, basically, demographically. Um, and, it, and it's nice because there are three different scales of the census data that we can use. And then the last one I mentioned is a management category. So within our street rights of way, the ROW is, is right of way, uh, as well as by different land use or zoning types, that influences certainly things from a management and a policy standpoint. Um, and, and this information allows you to take a big picture at where your, your community is at for your existing and your uh, potential tree, co tree cover. And then always in designing the assessment is think about your audience and what kind of products are going to be useful to them. H how often are they going to use these? Uh, are they going to be GIS users? Uh, or if, if not, then that's fine. Uh, we have uh, several examples I'll show for non-GIS users. So I'll show you uh, eight different assessment boundaries that we used recently in uh, some work with Washington, D.C. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time, but we have the overall city boundary. We had nine different ward boundaries. We had 39 uh, neighborhood commissions. So again, thinking of those different categories I mentioned earlier, um, we had land use data that was available. So now we can break out um, both citywide as well as we took the land use data down to each neighborhood. So you, not only would you have um, different densities of, of residential land use, uh, commercial, industrial, institutional land use, et cetera, but we broke the data out for each neighborhood. So not just district-wide, we know what our canopy and planting space is for, let's say, medium density residential, but you could go within each, each sub-neighborhood at that scale. So it's really, really powerful information. Uh, we had watersheds, the census blocks that I mentioned. So in DC, there were 6,500 census blocks. For each one of those, we have the same assessment metrics. Um, for parcels, almost 135,000 parcels, every single one has the same information, but at that scale. So at that individual property level, what's our canopy, what's our planting space? And then lastly, our, our right-of-way. And I'll show you a few examples of, of some ways we, we get very specific and detailed with um, existing and possible canopy cover within the uh, public rights-of-way. Some common deliverables, uh, we've talked quite a bit about these first two and, and just spoke about uh, assessment boundaries. Um, what we do is put that information into uh, a user-friendly spreadsheet. We also have a canopy calculator tool that allows you to plug and play with these numbers if we planted this number of trees in this zoning or land use category or neighborhood what would that do to the city, the, the canopy cover in that neighborhood or in that zoning type, as well as what would that do citywide? I'll show an example of that later on. We have some interactive low-tech maps that we've made uh, that, are, that are still interactive in the sense that you can turn layers on and off just within a PDF environment. So that's a, a tool that anybody can use. You don't need to have the GIS data. Um, but I think it, it's taken a while for 
myself and others to doing these assessments for years to realize that you can't just simply give a lot of data, uh, the, the raw data, let's say, um, or just simply in a GIS format and expect people to pick it up and fully utilize the information in ways that I know how we could customize uh, an analysis to be useful to different audiences in any part of the country. Uh, so that's really what we're trying to do here is take some of the guesswork out. Uh, and finally, um, any s some form of training, potentially reporting, and maybe um, some kind of summary uh, that would be useful in disseminating the results. The last thing I wanted to mention in this, this section is about the recommendations that, g that can be a component of a UTC assessment. Um, I'm not going to go through every one of these, but this is sort of generalized. So these aren't specific recommendations. These are, generally speaking, we like to have this be a part of the planning process. You're not necessarily writing a plan at the end of an assessment. You, you can, uh, but typically it, it's providing an assessment, of course. So really, after looking at that and after discussing, what do we think are some logical next steps? How, how would we recommend cre uh, communicating the information? Uh, what are the specific opportunities out there? How can we make sure that a report uh, shows that and highlights that? Um, are there policy implications of some of the outcomes? And are there partnerships that should be coming out of, of an assessment? Um, that's, those are all different ways that we can use the information. So what I want to cover next um, is really the results of what, what some of this looks like. So what are the maps and tables and charts and, and such? And what do some of these tools actually look like? So mostly we're going we're gonna to talk about looking at different results at different scales, uh, different assessment boundaries. So uh, first, just a, an overview, I guess, of the, the land cover data. So as Chris talked about, um, my understanding right now is that just the canopy cover has been mapped uh, in the areas that he talked about. So this shows sort of our distribution of land cover with all eight of these different classifications, uh, a couple of sort of insets uh, to zoom in to see what that looks like at a finer scale. Uh, again, this is really the most time consuming and costly part of these projects. Um, we tend to be in the 90 to 95 percent accuracy overall for the land cover mapping. And when you start to get multiple classes, uh, that becomes fairly complex and it's a lot of data certainly to churn through, um, but just visually looking through the data and making manual corrections is a, is a time consuming process, uh, but it's really required to do change assessment over time, um, especially between two different data sets. So this uh, first example here is looking at um, how we can symbolize those different assessment boundaries by percentages of tree cover. So all four of these are showing existing tree canopy. Um, citywide, not a very exciting map. 33% uh, tree cover overall. This was Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, but we can break the data out by land use types, as I mentioned. Uh, you can start to see at a finer scale. Um, this is basically at the parcel or property level. Uh, again, census blocks. So these are individual census blocks. And we can see where canopy is higher and where it's lower. And similarly for uh, watersheds, or what they called creek sheds. Now, we could turn this on its side, and instead of pointing the colors to the existing tree cover percent value, we could point that to uh, the planting space. Uh, one of the other UTC assessment types that I mentioned was canopy cover change. This is an assessment in Cincinnati where we had a 10-year ten, ten different uh, ten year difference between two different image, uh, image periods, and we're able to look at where there's been sort of no significant change. Uh, losses, larger losses, and um, larger gains. So pretty powerful. Uh, this is per neighborhood boundary. Uh, I think they call them community boundaries. Um, this next example I had kind of alluded to earlier, where we are taking the street right away. So this is all of your um, all of your streets and roads in the city. Uh, we're looking. It's it's basically everything that's not a parcel, of course. Um, and we're taking that area and we're clipping, like a cookie cutter, the tree cover and the planting space to just simply that zone or just that area. We then overlay that with each neighborhood and we can merge this information together so that you can have a database that shows the neighborhood boundaries, but also, uh, if you think of it, you have canopy cover and planting space for the entire neighborhood 
or now just the, the portion in the right-of-way in that neighborhood. So it's really powerful because um, you can start having a discussion on a much more localized level about what we have and what we need to be doing differently. This next example is, is nice because basically we're using a query in the GIS to tell us which parcel boundaries meet a certain condition of canopy cover and planting space. And this is more wide open. We're saying uh, anything less than 25% tree cover and anything greater than, it's an and statement, so it has to, each parcel has to have less than 25% tree cover but also greater than 25% planting area. Now, uh, in Utah, 25% existing canopy cover, uh, same here in Colorado, it's probably not a very good number to use. Well, the district's at about 36.5%, 37% tree cover, um, so it's a different story. This example on the right shows that we can do a much more selective or constrained query, and now we um, have less th properties with less than 10% tree cover, but they have greater than half of the property that's available for planting area. So that's a much more constrained, and you can see there's just 15,000 out of, what, 135,000 that met that, qu that query. Um, I'll just mention real quick bef uh, on that last example, when you're at the parcel level, you could do all sorts of things, um, which properties have less than 10% tree cover or, or whatever number, and if you have addresses in that database, you can literally create a mailing list and send that out to, to cities and say, um, you know, to our, your residents and say, we're looking to do uh, tree planting. Maybe it's um, a targeted mailing to businesses, for example. So there's a lot, lot you can do with, with this information. Um, this example here is really talking about the potential of planting in and around parking lots. Um, so what we've done is merge the, the parcels data uh, that with parking lots, and now we can hone in on, uh, in this case, about 860 locations throughout the city where this is what we have. We have a lot of planting space. We have a lot of impervious surface cover. Um, this example is sort of your ideal situation. We have a major highway. There'd be air quality benefits and noise reduction benefits of trees. We have uh, uh, the Anacostia River, uh, so we could create better stream buffers. You can see, if you can see right here, there's virtually nothing. Um, we have recreation. So now we have people. We have population density. They want to come in to these areas. This parking lot doesn't look like somebody somewhere that I'd really want to hang out and, um, and have any sort of community sense. So this is a great area from this data set where you can drill down very specifically. Uh, another example, I don't, I don't think it applies quite as well in Colorado where I am or, or in Utah, but um, this was in Washington State. Um, basically, we did a, a change assessment. We looked at about an eight or nine year period of change in the city uh, at two different time periods of imagery. And one of the things we were able to do is to see where they've lost tree cover, as you can see right here. But we were also able to say, well, now, now is now. Now is the present. And what do we still have that's at risk? from development and loss. So we looked at slopes, we looked at um, land use and zoning types, and ultimately what we came up with was that uh, about 27% of the entire uh, city's existing tree cover, about a quarter of their trees, was, or at least from a cover standpoint, uh, was at risk from further development. So that's, that, that was a pretty big uh, wake up, I think, from a sort of policy and planning perspective. So um, end to end, uh, we have all the different sort of assessment boundaries, the ways we can break that information out in more uh, tables and charts and that kind of representation, um, and, and then ultimately our, our reports. I want to talk a bit about goal setting, um, the canopy cover goal setting. So if this is of interest to you, I, I have some questions that maybe you want, might want to think through. Um, and then I have a tool, the canopy calculator tool that I mentioned, and then I have a process, uh, a methodology, which is something uh, called the 75th percentile rule that we use. So first, uh, just some, some fun pictures. Uh, these are things that are not working towards canopy cover goals in our cities. Um, I think we've all seen uh, this scenario. Um, this is outside of my mother-in-law's house in Allentown, Pennsylvania. They have a two-foot wide planting strip with a fairly large ginkgo. Uh, that's not that's not going to work long term. This is downtown in Denver, um, a honey locust tree uh, that's just hanging on. We'll see how much longer it lasts. 
And then, of course, uh, less of an issue in, in the western United States uh, is utilities, but of course we still have underground utilities. Um, so those are some things, of course, that work against canopy cover goals. Um, here are a few photos that I've seen. Uh, this is out in California. Uh, this is here in Denver, um, looking at uh, establishing tree cover in parking lots. Hopefully there's some decent structural soils underneath there. Um, and then I, I thought this was interesting. I was in Ontario three weeks ago for the uh, Canadian Urban Forestry Conference. And there's actually a, this, is, this says Trees by Jameson, and it's a private company that I, I assume is either advertising or, or was doing some kind of publicity. And they've planted probably 50, 60, 70 trees in this roundabout uh, cloverleaf uh, next to a highway. So these are some things, of course, that, that are working towards canopy cover goals. Really, canopy cover goal setting is important. Um, it, it, it's different in what part of the country you're in, certainly. Um, I, I think it's slightly lesser importance, or at least it, it needs to be addressed much differently in the drier western, uh, interior west where we live. Um, here is right outside of our office. We have a, a bus stop location. It's 95 degree day about uh, six, eight weeks ago. Um, so can we prioritize areas where uh, we can have maximum public, public benefits? Um, we look at prioritizing tree planting all across the city using GIS uh, as well as uh, on the ground field work uh, for these different sort of benefits that trees provide. So we can do that um, with, with different GIS data sets from the community. If we're, if we're considering goal setting, you know, one question right off the bat might be, are we content where we are? Um, maybe preservation of what we already have is, is our goal. I would hope in Colorado and Utah, for example, that um, I think we're, we're certainly aforesting and we're going to see more canopy over time. Um, but I was in Cleveland two weeks ago for a canopy assessment workshop and one of the cities I had worked with there about uh, five years ago, they, they were roughly at 40% tree cover. They knew they, they don't want to stop growth. Uh, they want to promote economic development, but their goal really is preservation. Um, so I, I think ultimately one of my favorite statements I've seen in um, an American Planning Association report on the urban forest is that you should have a net positive gain from the investment that you make in tree cover uh, and that should be your sort of measurable outcome. Do we have a net positive gain if we pursued greater canopy? Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these, um, but uh, they're considerations essentially during the goal setting process. Um, now let me talk about the couple tools and processes here. I'll, uh, I'm going to move a little, little quicker. Uh, we're going to run out of time here shortly. Um, this is a, a, just a view, a screen capture of a, an Excel-based canopy calculator tool uh, that I've, I developed maybe five years ago and we've been expanding on this um, in different ways since. Uh, real quickly, what you can do is say that you want to reach a percentage of canopy cover in commercial land use. So if we wanted to reach 25% tree cover, we can come down here and these blue text values populate. Uh, the commercial here, if we wanted to reach 25, uh, and we had and we lose 10% of those trees over time, uh, that's that mortality, it would take about 10,300 trees to do that just specifically in this commercial uh, area and their existing was 14%. I think this is uh, Vancouver, Washington if, if I remember. So uh, that's how that's one way the tool works. The other way is you could populate this column right here, update the number of trees. So you could say, well, what if we plant 1,000 trees in our commercial areas? What if our residents, we get a big campaign and we can get 10,000 new trees? You can see what the impact is going to be on canopy cover in residential areas as well as uh, down here below at the bottom. It will summarize that citywide. Uh, the next goal setting technique that I want to talk about briefly is what we call the, the 75th percentile rule. Um, we we saw this in a report uh, from about uh, 12 years ago at Portland State University. Um, very quickly, without getting too deep into it, what, what this does is it looks at the existing tree cover percentage uh, at any scale. This could be, in this case, by neighborhood boundaries. Um, maybe you would do this by parcels. Uh, so you assess canopy cover, overlay your property boundaries, then look at just your residential properties. Well, you're going to have a low value and a high value. And if you can put those into quantiles, what this rule basically does is says, go look at the 75th percentile as the data is put into quantiles. Um, and what is the canopy cover percentage at the 75th percentile? And in this, in this case, 
if we chunk the data out, so to speak, into these four quantiles, and we look at what is that cutoff value? Where does it go from the 74th to the 75th percentile? Well, in this case, for their neighborhoods, it's about 26% tree cover. So this is a really great way to say, well, the American forests go for 40% tree cover if you're in the east or the northwest, or 25% if you're in the uh, interior, uh, drier areas of the country. That, you know, that's not, that's not enough in a lot of cases. So this is actually able to say, well, we've been able to quantify, uh, to, sorry, to achieve a certain canopy cover percentage um, in, again, at the neighborhood scale, uh, within a specific land use type at the parcel level, and you can use the data to say, well, where do we think the other three-fourths of the city could be aiming to achieve to? So I, I, that's a pretty quick rundown, but I hope that, uh, hope that makes sense. Um, real quickly, some more interactive tools and technologies that I want to cover. Um, the first one is really for the non-GIS user. Um, one of the great things you can do these days is put GIS data layers into PDFs that even the free version of Adobe Reader uh, can open up and look at. What you can do is these little checks, these little eyeballs here, you can turn these off, and these are different data layers that are represented in these maps. So we have, for example, uh, the land cover data. We have, what is the, where are the actual polygons around each of the trees or forests? Um, and we take the UTC assessment results, and we, we take some of the guesswork out. So when I said, which properties have less than 10% tree cover, but they have greater than 50% planting area? Well, that, that would be your low-hanging fruit, right? So we have a, a column over here. It's probably very hard to see, but it says low UTC and high possible vegetation. So those are areas where it's, it's again, your, um, your, your best opportunities. So you could put a street tree inventory in here, um, all types of information, uh, neighborhood boundaries, and so forth. So this is one example. I have a, one other one real quick. This is some doing, using the same technique and technology in, um, in DC. We basically made one of these maps for every one of their neighborhood boundaries. I think there were almost four, almost 40 of those. So this way, it's really taking the big picture, but bringing it down to much more uh, specific uh, locally um, uh, for, for implementation purposes, essentially. Um, I know we're going to run out of time, so I don't want to I don't want to cut too much to the top of the hour here. Um, the next several examples are a uh, land use planning software in ArcGIS that we've been using for a few years now. Um, the first few examples are how to do a prioritization model, so it's a it's a suitability model. Where are the areas that would be most suitable for tree planting? Um, this is looking at parcels in a city in Pennsylvania that we were working with. Um, and you can you can adjust the weights of different factors. So what's what's the most important area uh, or, or theme? Maybe it's air quality. Well, maybe we want to prioritize tree planting along roads and around parking lots. That's the type of things you can do. Um, the next example is is identical, except instead of looking at parcels, we're actually prioritizing individual tree planting locations in the streets. Uh, so where are the vacant sites along the streets? And then some other tools we've done is to make more site-specific planning and, and design tools so that you can actually select different types of trees from a palette. At, you, you can put those into the map. Uh, you can do things like enter specific costs. Um, and you can track the changes that the, the new tree cover you're adding to your landscape is actually making. Um, we've tied in iTree data, for example, to say, well, as maybe if we come up with benefits per acre of trees, well, as you're adding trees uh, and doing these site plans, you can be tracking costs and benefits um, and all, all types of information. But it's definitely the more higher end um, technical process. So you can see here is an example of the, it's dynamic. You make changes in the map, well, how much stormwater do our trees mitigate? Um, what, what's the average cost of, of these trees? Uh, what's the average size of these trees? So all of these values are going to be changing on the fly as you use these types of tools. Um, sorry to go a little quick there at the end, but I know we were running out of time, so I want to um, pass it back off to Rose and Meredith to wrap up. I, I, I'm sorry if I went a little long. Um, I think I'll take it from here. Ian, I think that uh, what you had was really interesting and informative.
developing the written work to talk about it in the presentation. So we are really thankful for the Forest Service for supporting Utah and kind of our urban tree canopy ambition. Um, also, thanks to Ian and Chris for taking the time out of your day today and all of the planning that it takes to do this. Um, Ian, if you don't mind, I think that there are some questions popping up in the chat. I've got a few things I want to talk about with the group, and then maybe we can throw it out to you to answer some of the questions coming up in the chat pod. Sure. The main thing that I want to, to challenge everyone to think about is that this is a different way of looking at tree inventory from the typical forest management that you know, the urban forestry program has been promoting, but I think it's a really unique opportunity as I've been working more and more with these folks in the GIS uh, spectrum, it just seems like there's a lot more limitless concept that we could potentially integrate into our planning. There's a lot more sellable information, the mapping, the connections that this imagery can make to things that, that Ian had mentioned about, you know, specific areas or specific socioeconomic groups or specific watersheds. And so, what, what I would like to check out on the participants here thinking about creative ways to integrate this and how this information might spark some kind of interest within your communities. Um, what are the questions that you have that need good answers that maybe this data can provide um, help with? What resonated specifically with what Chris and Ian talked about? Um, because as a forestry agency, we're interested in promoting this and taking it to the next level, but we really want a bottom-up approach. So we want to hear from you guys, the boots on the ground, to say what, if we're only going to take you know, three, develop three new tools, let's say, okay, what are the most tools that we can give you in the field to actually be effective and, and to make a big impact? Because what I don't want to see is a, uh, a another interesting set of data that just sits on the shelf. So we're really committed to taking the next steps to be effective and to be helpful for you all, but I'm really interested in getting the feedback from you all on what types of things might really help move your programs forward. Um, so please feel free to contact me. I'm sure that Chris is going to be willing to touch base with you guys or to you know, bounce ideas off if you have specific questions for them. But we are hoping to potentially develop a working group, maybe some grant potential programs, some target uh, pilot projects, or even a statewide project um, surrounding some of this data. So I would love to hear feedback via email or feel free to give me a call and, and we can continue this conversation. Um, but that is pretty much all for me, so I'll hand it back over to Ian and Maybe you can answer any of the specific questions that are coming up. Yes, I can. Sure, you can hear me, Meredith? I, I ask yes, I, can. I ask as soon as you went on mute, probably. Um, let's see. Uh, there's. It looks like maybe just a, maybe one comment and then one question. Um, there's a question here. It says, oh, I just lost it. Hold on. Let me come back to that. Um, this is from Jeff. Uh, I'm not sure how UTC analysis addresses young trees. My yard is overstocked with too many young trees that I will thin out as I see how well the different species do in the poor soil. Air photos um, would show low density, yet the last thing I need is to plant more trees. Um, I guess the first comment that I would have, and, and Chris, you know, if you want to, if you want to chime in as well, come off mute or something. Um, it, it UTC may not address. It's it's not necessarily a technology uh, that that's supposed to address everything. Um, it certainly we're not going to replace uh, on the ground inventories. Um, I, I would think you know, um, that one thing it, it can do is accurately uh, depict where we have current canopy cover, and then those air those properties where we're having the where we're going to see growth in the future through maybe it's you know eight or ten years later in another analysis. Um, now, if we had LIDAR data, as uh, Chris had mentioned, that's probably something that would be able to look at a much finer scale like that, um, maybe even pull out a number of, of stems uh, from an area. Um, but again, I, you know, UTC may not be the technology um, to, to help with that specific um, sort of more site-specific management um, 
uh, in, th in that particular case. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it, I guess it's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, if there's any other comments back on that, um, please feel free to add it to the, uh, to the chat box. Um, I see um, Hal Jensen said, uh, I think it's more of a comment, um, it would be interesting to develop a site planning spec for those areas that you identify so that you could give the site owners a specific planting spec to ensure the long tree, uh, long term tree survival. Um, yes, I, I would certainly agree. Um, that seems like maybe a topic for a, a larger uh, conversation or a larger uh, discussion. But um, and, uh, unless I'm missing any up above, I'm not sure if there were any other specific questions. Uh, certainly, I think you're good, Ian. And um, with that, I think we'll conclude. Unless Chris has anything else to say. Nope, I think Ian did a great job covering it. Great. All right, well, I would like to remind um, our participants that we have another webinar coming up. This webinar will be on Tuesday, November 27th, at the same time, 12 o'clock p.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. That one is going to be about strategic tree planting um, with Randy Gordon from the Arbor Day Foundation and Meredith Perkins with the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands. So mark your calendars for that, and we'll conclude. Thank you very much for attending. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rose. Thanks, Meredith.